Chapter 23 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Martin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 23 The Reward of Persistence. Every noble work is at first impossible. Carlyle. Victory belongs to the most persevering. Napoleon. Success in most things depends on knowing how long it takes to succeed. Montesquieu Perpetual pushing and assurance put a difficulty out of countenance and make a seeming impossibility give way. Jeremy Collier Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. The nerve that never relaxes, the eye that never blanches, the thought that never wanders, these are the masters of victory. Burke The pit rose at me, exclaimed Edmund Keen, in a wild tumult of emotion, as he rushed home to his trembling wife. Mary, you shall ride in your carriage yet, and Charles shall go to Eden. He had been so terribly in earnest with the study of his profession that he had at length made a mark on his generation. He was a little dark man with a voice naturally harsh, but he determined, when young, to play the character of Sir Giles Overreach in Massinger's drama, and no other man had ever played it. By a persistency that nothing seemed able to daunt, he so trained himself to play the character that his success, when it did come, was overwhelming, and all London was at his feet. I am sorry to say that I don't think this is in your line, said Woodfall, the reporter, after Sheridan had made his first speech in Parliament. You would better have stuck to your former pursuits. With head on his hand, Sheridan mused for a time, then looked up and said, It is in me and it shall come out of me. From the same man came that harangue against Warren Hastings, which the orator Fox called the best speech ever made in the House of Commons. I had no other books than heaven and earth, which are open to all, said Bernard Palissy, who left his home in the south of France in 1828 at the age of 18. Though only a glass painter, he had the soul of an artist. The sight of an elegant Italian cup disturbed his whole existence, and from that moment the determination to discover the animal with which it was glazed possessed him like a passion. For months and years he tried all kinds of experiments to learn the materials of which the animal was composed. He built a furnace, which was a failure, and then a second, burning so much wood, spoiling so many drugs and pots of common earthenware, and losing so much time that poverty stared him in the face, and he was forced, from lack of ability to buy fuel, to try his experiments in a common furnace. Flat failure was the result, but he decided on the spot to begin all over again and soon had three hundred pieces baking, one of which came out covered with beautiful enamel. To perfect his invention, he next built a glass furnace, carrying the bricks on his back. At length the time came for a trial, but though he kept the heat up six days, his enamel would not melt. His money was all gone, but he borrowed some and bought more pots and wood and tried to get a better flux. When next he lighted his fire, he attained no result until his fuel was gone. Tearing off the palings of his garden fence, he fed them to the flames, but in vain. His furniture followed to no purpose. The shelves of his pantry were then broken up and thrown into the furnace, and the great burst of heat melted the enamel. The grand secret was learned. Persistence had triumphed again.
you work hard two weeks without selling a book, wrote a publisher to an agent, you will make a success of it. Know thy work and do it, said Carlyle, and work at it like a Hercules. Whoever is resolved to excel in painting, or indeed in any other art, said Reynolds, must bring all his mind to bear upon that one object from the moment that he rises till he goes to bed. I have no secret but hard work, said Turner, the painter. The man who is perpetually hesitating which of two things he will do first, said William Wirt, will do neither. The man who resolves but suffers his resolution to be changed by the first counter-suggestion of a friend, who fluctuates from opinion to opinion, from plan to plan, and veers like a weathercock to every point of the compass, with every breath of caprice that blows, can never accomplish anything great or useful. Instead of being progressive in anything, he will be at best stationary, and, more probably, retrograde in all. Perseverance built the pyramids on Egypt's plains, erected the gorgeous temple at Jerusalem, enclosed in adamant the Chinese empire, scaled the stormy, cloud-capped Alps, opened a highway through the watery wilderness of the Atlantic, leveled the forests of the New World, and reared in its steed a community of states and nations. Perseverance has wrought from the marble block the exquisite creations of genius, painted on canvas the gorgeous mimicry of nature, and engraved on a metallic surface the viewless substance of the shadow. Perseverance has put in motion millions of spindles, winged as many flying shuttles, harnessed thousands of iron steeds to as many freighted cars, and set them flying from town to town and nation to nation, tunneled mountains of granite and annihilated space with the lightning's speed. It has whitened the waters of the world with the sails of a hundred nations, navigated every sea and explored every land. It has reduced nature in her thousand forms to as many sciences taught her laws, prophesied her future movements, measured her untrodden spaces, counted her myriad hosts of worlds, and computed their distances, dimensions, and velocities. The slow penny is surer than the quick dollar. The slow trotter will out-travel the fleet racer. Genius darts, flutters, and tires but perseverance wears and wins. The all-day horse wins the race. The afternoon man wears off the laurels. The last blow drives home the nail. Are your discoveries often brilliant intuitions? asked a reporter of Thomas A. Edison. Do they come to you while you are lying awake nights? I never did anything worth doing by accident, was the reply, nor did any of my inventions come indirectly through accident, except the phonograph. No, when I have fully decided that a result is worth getting, I go ahead on it and make trial after trial until it comes. I have always kept strictly within the lines of commercially useful inventions. I have never had any time to put on electrical wonders, valuable simply as novelties to catch the popular fancy. I like it, continued the inventor. I don't know any other reason. Anything I have begun is always on my mind, and I am not easy while away from it until it is finished. A man who thus gives himself wholly to his work is certain to accomplish something. 
and if he have ability and common sense, his success will be great. How Bulwer wrestled with the fates to change his apparent destiny. His first novel was a failure, his early poems were failures, and his youthful speeches provoked the ridicule of his opponents. But he fought his way to eminence through ridicule and defeat. Gibbon worked 20 years on his Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Noah Webster spent 36 years on his dictionary. What a sublime patience he showed in devoting a life to the collection and a definition of words. George Bancroft spent 26 years on his History of the United States. Newton rewrote his Chronology of Ancient Nations 15 times. Titian wrote to Charles V, I send your majesty the last supper, after working on it almost daily for seven years. He worked on his Pietro Martin eight years. George Stevenson was 15 years perfecting his locomotive. What, 20 years on his condensing engine. Harvey labored eight long years before he published his discovery of the circulation of the blood. He was then called a crack-brained imposter by his fellow physicians. Amid abuse and ridicule, he waited 25 years before his great discovery was recognized by the profession. Newton discovered the law of gravitation before he was 21, but one slight error in a measurement of the Earth's circumference interfered with a demonstration of the correctness of his theory. Twenty years later he corrected the error and showed that the planets roll in their orbits as a result of the same law which brings an apple to the ground. Southern, the great actor, said that the early part of his theatrical career was spent in getting dismissed for incompetency. Never depend upon your genius, said John Ruskin, in the words of Joshua Reynolds. If you have talent, industry will improve it. If you have none, industry will supply the deficiency. Savages believe that when they conquer an enemy, his spirit enters into them and fights for them ever afterwards. So the spirit of our conquests enters us and helps us to win the next victory. Blucher may have been routed at Ligny yesterday, but today you hear the thunder of his guns at Waterloo hurling dismay and death among his former conquerors. Opposing circumstances create strength. Opposition gives us greater power of resistance. To overcome one barrier gives us greater ability to overcome the next. In February 1492, a poor grey-haired man, his head bowed with discouragement almost to the back of his mule, rode slowly out through the beautiful gateway of the Alhambra. From boyhood he had been haunted with the idea that the earth is round. He believed that the piece of carved wood picked up 400 miles at sea, and the bodies of two men unlike any other human beings known, found on the shores of Portugal, had drifted from unknown lands in the west. But his last hope of obtaining aid for a voyage of discovery had failed. King John of Portugal while pretending to think of helping him, had sent out secretly an expedition of his own. He had begged bread, drawn maps and charts to keep from starving. He had lost his wife, his friends had called him crazy, and forsaken him. The council of wise men, called by Ferdinand and Isabella, ridiculed his theory of reaching the east by sailing west. But the sun and moon are round, said Columbus, why not the earth? If the earth is a ball, what holds it up? asked the wise men. What holds the sun and moon up? 
inquired Columbus. But how can men walk with their heads down and their feet up, like flies on a ceiling? asked a learned doctor. How can trees grow with their roots in the air? The water would run out of the ponds and we should fall off, said another philosopher. This doctrine is contrary to the Bible, which says, The heavens are stretched out like a tent. Of course it is flat. It is rank heresy to say it is round, said a priest. Columbus left the Alhambra in despair, intending to offer his services to Charles VII, but he heard a voice calling his name. An old friend had told Isabella that it would add great renown to her reign at a trifling expense if what the sailor believed should prove true. It shall be done, said Isabella. I will pledge my jewels to raise the money. Call him back. Columbus turned, and with him turned the world. Not a sailor would go voluntarily, so the king and queen compelled them. Three days out, in his vessels, scarcely larger than fishing schooners, the Pinta floated a signal of distress for a broken rudder. Terror seized the sailors, but Columbus calmed their fears with pictures of gold and precious stones from India. Two hundred miles west of the Canaries, the compass ceased to point to the North Star. The sailors are ready to mutiny, but he tells them the North Star is not exactly north. Twenty-three hundred miles from home, though he tells them it is but seventeen hundred, a bush with berries floats by, land birds fly near, and they pick up a piece of wood curiously carved. On October 12th, Columbus raised the banner of Castile over the Western world. How hard I worked at that tremendous shorthand, and all improvement appertaining to it, said Dickens. I will only add to what I have already written of my perseverance at this time of my life, and of a patient and continuous energy which then began to be matured. Cyrus W. Field had retired from business with a large fortune when he became possessed with the idea that by means of a cable laid upon the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, telegraphic communication could be established between Europe and America. He plunged into the undertaking with all the force of his being. The preliminary work included the construction of a telegraph line 1,000 miles long, from New York to St. John's, Newfoundland. Through 400 miles of almost unbroken forest, they had to build a road, as well as a telegraph line across Newfoundland. Another stretch of 140 miles across the island of Cape Breton involved a great deal of labor as did the laying of a cable across the St. Lawrence. By hard work, he secured aid for his company from the British government. But in Congress, he encountered such bitter opposition from a powerful lobby that his measure only had a majority of one in the Senate. The cable was loaded upon the Agamemnon, the flagship of the British fleet at Sebastopol, and upon the Niagara, a magnificent new frigate of the United States Navy. But when five miles of cable had been paid out, it caught in the machinery and parted. On a second trial, when 200 miles at sea, the electric current was suddenly lost, and men paced the decks nervously and sadly, as if in the presence of death. Just as Mr. Field was about to give the order to cut the cable, the current returned as quickly and mysteriously as it had disappeared. The following night, when the ship was moving but four miles an hour, and the cable running out at the rate of six miles, the brakes were applied too suddenly 
just as the steamer gave a heavy lurch, breaking the cable. Field was not the man to give up. Seven hundred miles more of cable were ordered, and a man of great skill was set to work to devise a better machine for paying out the long line. American and British inventors united in making a machine. At length, in mid-ocean, the two halves of the cable were spliced and the steamers began to separate. The one headed for Ireland, the other for Newfoundland, each running out the precious thread, which it was hoped would bind two continents together. Before the vessels were three miles apart, the cable parted. Again it was spliced, but when the ships were 80 miles apart, the current was lost. A third time the cable was spliced, and about 200 miles paid out, when it parted some 20 feet from the Agamemnon, and the vessels returned to the coast of Ireland. Directors were disheartened. The public skeptical, capitalists were shy, and but for the indomitable energy and persuasiveness of Mr. Field, who worked day and night, almost without food or sleep, the whole project would have been abandoned. Finally, a third attempt was made, with such success that the whole cable was laid without a break and several messages were flashed through nearly 700 leagues of ocean, when suddenly the current ceased. Faith now seemed dead, except in the breast of Cyrus W. Field and one or two friends. Yet with such persistence did they work that they persuaded men to furnish capital for yet another trial, even against what seemed their better judgment. A new and superior cable was loaded upon the Great Eastern, which steamed slowly out to sea, paying out as she advanced. Everything worked to a charm until within 600 miles of Newfoundland, when the cable snapped and sank. After several attempts to raise it, the enterprise was abandoned for a year. Not discouraged by all these difficulties, Mr. Field went to work with a will, organized a new company, and made a new cable far superior to anything before used. And on July 13, 1866, was begun the trial which ended with the following message sent to New York. Heart's Content, July 27. We arrived here at nine o'clock this morning. All well, thank God, the cable is laid and is in perfect working order. Cyrus W. Field The old cable was picked up, spliced and continued to Newfoundland, and the two are still working, with good prospects for usefulness for many years. In Revelation we read, he that overcometh, I will give him to sit down with me on my throne. Successful men, it is said, owe more to their perseverance than to their natural powers, their friends, or the favorable circumstances around them. Genius will falter by the side of labor. Great powers will yield to great industry. Talent is desirable but perseverance is more so. How long did it take you to learn to play? asked a young man of Gerardini. Twelve hours a day for twenty years, replied the great violinist. Lyman Beecher, when asked how long it took him to write his celebrated sermon on the government of God, replied, About... 40 years. A Chinese student, discouraged by repeated failures, had thrown away his book in despair. When he saw a poor woman rubbing an iron bar on a stone to make a needle. This example of patience 
sent him back to his studies with a new determination, and he became one of the three greatest scholars of China. Malibran said, If I neglect my practice a day, I see the difference in my execution. If for two days, my friends see it. And if for a week, all the world knows my failure. Constant, persistent struggle she found to be the price of her marvellous power. When an East India boy is learning archery, he is compelled to practice three months drawing the string to his ear before he is allowed to touch an arrow. Benjamin Franklin had this tenacity of purpose in a wonderful degree. When he started in the printing business in Philadelphia, he carried his material through the streets on a wheelbarrow. He hired one room for his office, workroom, and sleeping room. He found a formidable rival in the city and invited him to his room. Pointing to a piece of bread from which he had just eaten his dinner, he said, Unless you can live cheaper than I can, you cannot starve me out. All are familiar with the misfortune of Carlyle while writing his History of the French Revolution. After the first volume was ready for the press, he loaned the manuscript to a neighbor who left it lying on the floor, and the servant girl took it to kindle the fire. It was a bitter disappointment, but Carlyle was not the man to give up. After many months of poring over hundreds of volumes of authorities and scores of manuscripts, he reproduced that which had burned in a few minutes. Audubon, the naturalist, had spent two years with his gun and notebook in the forests of America, making drawings of birds. He nailed them all up securely in a box and went off on a vacation. When he returned, he opened the box, only to find a nest of Norwegian rats in his beautiful drawings. Everyone was ruined. It was a terrible disappointment. But Audubon took his gun and notebook and started for the forest. He reproduced his drawings, and they were even better than the first. When Dickens was asked to read one of his selections in public, he replied that he had not time, for he was in the habit of reading the same piece every day for six months before reading it in public. My own invention, he says, such as it is, I assure you, would never have served me, as it has but for the habit of commonplace, humble, patient, toiling attention. Addison amassed three volumes of manuscript before he began the Spectator. Everyone admires a determined, persistent man. Marcus Morton ran 16 times for governor of Massachusetts. At last, his opponents voted for him from admiration of his pluck, and he was elected by a majority of one. Such persistence always triumphs. Webster declared that when a pupil at Phillips Exeter Academy, he never could declaim before the school. He said he committed piece after piece and rehearsed them in his room. But when he heard his name called in the academy and all eyes turned towards him, the room became dark and everything he ever knew fled from his brain. But he became the great orator of America. Indeed, it is doubtful whether Demosthenes himself surpassed his great reply to Hain in the United States Senate. Webster's tenacity was illustrated by a circumstance which occurred in the academy. The principal punished him for shooting pigeons by compelling him to commit 100 lines of Virgil. He knew the principal was to take a certain train that afternoon, so he went to his room and learned 700 lines. He went to recite them to the principal just before train time. After repeating the hundred lines, he continued until he had recited two hundred. The 
principal anxiously looked at his watch and grew nervous, but Webster kept right on. The principal finally stopped him and asked him how many more he had learned. About 500 more, said Webster, continuing to recite. You can have the rest of the day for pigeon shooting, said the principal. Great writers have ever been noted for their tenacity of purpose. Their works have not been flung off from minds aglow with genius, but have been elaborated and elaborated into grace and beauty until every trace of their efforts has been obliterated. Bishop Butler worked twenty years incessantly on his analogy, and even then was so dissatisfied that he wanted to burn it. Rousseau says he obtained the ease and grace of his style only by ceaseless inquietude, by endless blotches and erasures. Virgil worked eleven years on the Aeneid. The notebooks of great men like Hawthorne and Emerson are telltales of the enormous drudgery of the years put into a book which may be read in an hour. Montesquieu was twenty-five years writing his Esprit des Louis, yet you can read it in sixty minutes. Adam Smith spent ten years on his Wealth of Nations. A rival playwright once laughed at Euripides for spending three days on three lines, when he had written five hundred lines. But your five hundred lines in three days will be dead and forgotten while my three lines will live forever, he replied. Ariosto wrote his Description of a Tempest in sixteen different ways. He spent ten years on his Orlando Furioso and only sold one hundred copies at fifteen pence each. The proof of Burke's letters to a noble lord one of the sublimest things in all literature, went back to the publisher so changed and blotted with corrections that the printer absolutely refused to correct it, and it was entirely reset. Adam Tucker spent 18 years on the light of nature. Thoreau's New England pastoral, a week on the Concord and Merrimack rivers, was an entire failure 700 of the 1,000 copies printed were returned from the publishers. Thoreau wrote in his diary, I have some 900 volumes in my library, 700 of which I wrote myself. Yet he took up his pen with as much determination as ever. The rolling stone gathers no moss. The persistent tortoise outruns the swift but fickle hare. An hour a day for twelve years more than equals the time given to study in a four years course at a high school. The reading and rereading of a single volume has been the making of many a man. Patience, says Bulwer, is the courage of the conqueror. It is the virtue par excellence of man against destiny, of the one against the world and of the soul against matter. Therefore, this is the courage of the gospel, and its importance in a social view, its importance to races and institutions, cannot be too earnestly inculcated. Want of constancy is the cause of many a failure, making the millionaire of today a beggar tomorrow. Show me a really great triumph that is not the reward of persistence. One of the paintings which made Titian famous was on his easel eight years, another seven. How came popular writers famous? By writing for years without any pay at all, by writing hundreds of pages as mere practice work, by working like galley slaves at literature for half a lifetime with no other compensation than fame.
Never despair, says Burke. But if you do, work on in despair. The head of the god Hercules is represented as covered with a lion's skin with claws joined under the chin to show that when we have conquered our misfortunes, they become our helpers. Oh, the glory of an unconquerable will! End of chapter 23 The Reward of Persistence Recording by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland.